Well, I want to thank everyone out there in, uh, on their phones, on their computers, for checking out my YouTube channel. Uh, about four years ago, I put my first YouTube channel out into the internet, and the response was, was really strong, and so that made me want to want to share more of my information with the public. And over the last four years, we've had about 1.3 million views. That's been a lot of fun, and it's really been encouraging for us because it shows there's a lot of, a lot of need out there for uh, the information that we're sharing. So I just wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy life to check out our channel. What I have in my hand is the next step in our evolution as a system of trying to communicate ideas to you. There's a book that we've written. It's called Your Genius Body. And really what it is, it's a summary of all the work that we've put into our practice, put into functional medicine over the last about nine years. So if you like the ideas you see on today's video or some of the other videos on our channel, I would highly encourage you to get your hands on this book. This book is really a summary um, and a great reference for all the ideas that we use to help our patients as we share in these videos. So you can get this if you go to www.beyondmthfr.com and you'll have an option there to purchase the book either in paperback which uh, is always a little easier on the eyes or you can also download the digital version for your Kindles and iPads. So I hope you enjoy this coming video here and then please stay tuned for the end. We'll have a special message for you at the end of the video as well. Good evening everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg again from beyond MTHFR and Red Mountain Natural Medicine here in Boise. And the nature of today's short video is to answer a question that's come up uh, many times in the um, teachings I've done and seminars I've been part of. A question has come up that says, Doctor, you know, I understand that people with low dopamine have a certain set of symptoms and people with high dopamine have a certain set of symptoms, but what does it mean when you have both? And so I titled this talk, high or low dopamine, can you have symptoms of both? And it's taken me a few years to really put this answer together. Um, sometimes when you pursue knowledge, you don't always have every answer. And like I often say, if you're willing to be confused, you will in fact learn a great deal. It's the, uh, the people that run away or give up at the first bump in the road or first uh, sign of confusion that really limits their learning. So if you're one of those people that likes to grind it out and stay confused and fight to, to win the uh, pearl of wisdom, then uh, you, know, you and I have a lot in common. But the, the big idea here is this bell curve that we talk about. We've made quite a few videos about this. It's kind of a central idea in how I practice helping people feel better. And I say that because dopamine and your neurotransmitters control in a large part how you feel. And having dopamine in the incorrect range, uh, either too low or too high, does change our sense of well-being. And it does that predictably and repeatedly over and over and over again. Whether you're a man, woman, child, elderly person, doesn't matter. Uh, the same situation is going to be true. So low catecholamine people, low dopamine people, tend to have this set of symptoms highlighted by cravings. Oftentimes there's ADD problems, ADHD, addiction history, substance abuse often very impulsive, high risk, lots of anger and grumpiness, and then they have a meal and their dopamine goes back up and they feel much better. And these people tend to be excessively sleepy. On the other end of the curve, you kind of come through the middle and you go to the right side of the curve now. And we've talked uh, again about this group before, but it's the high catecholamine people. Individuals prone to anxiety, panic, worry, panic attacks. Uh, often there's an insomnia component. There may be chronic pain, paranoia. And if it's really, really bad, they end up with uh, manias, psychosis, and even possibly schizophrenia at the far end of the spectrum. So these are the two polar ends, low catecholamine, high catecholamine. And my job working on people clinically is to be able to classify them correctly because the treatment for someone who, with low catecholamines and low dopamine is actually very different than someone with high catecholamines. And this is one of those clinical pearls that we've learned over the years. So taking this bell curve a, note, a step further, recently um, thinking about this question, can you have symptoms of both high and low dopamine? This is a, a picture that came into my head and I wanted to, to put it in model form and have, uh, you know, put it out there and see what, see what, uh, what the response was. So this is a, a model that I call the set point model. In other words, the brain is trying to set the thermometer or set the, the ratio of receptors to dopamine correctly. And, I, and again, I apologize, this topic may be a little 
Again, a little complex, uh, but, but it's a good question. I'm really gonna you know, give you my best here to answer this. So what you're recognizing here on the screen is this red bell curve that you saw on the previous screen. This represents the dopamine bell curve or the catecholamine bell curve. The middle is where we wanna be. To the left, you have low dopamine symptoms, low catecholamine symptoms, and to the right, you have high. But what I've written in here is, I've drawn this box in here because what you're looking at is this is the quadrant of low dopamine, this, this rectangle. But what you see here, this yellow triangle that extends across, this is dopamine levels, the yellow dopamine receptor, I should say, forgive me, this is actually dopamine receptor density. And the blue level represents dopamine. So down in this left side of the bell curve, the, the blue represents dopamine. So yes, the further left you go on this bell curve, the lower dopamine you have. Yet conversely, the higher the receptor density is. So your brain's trying to balance this. If dopamine is rare, your body will build more um, protein you know, receptors on the surface of the cell to try to grab it. It'll increase the odds that that dopamine uh, connects to the receptor. But as you move from left to right, you see that the dopamine level gets better, builds up, and at that same time, the receptor level is going down. And so this is what happens. People with high dopamine, in order to balance the brain, the brain will remove receptors so that it's not really constantly blasted with this high dopamine activity all the time. So as the blue line increases, the yellow line goes down. And that's just the body trying to get to its, what I call the set points, trying to balance it out. So once we've had that concept uh, established, now we say, well, what happens during real life? Um, how come people with low catecholamines can have many low catecholamine symptoms, but sometimes they can feel anxious and they can have a, they can be, you know, kind of panicky. And how come people with, you know, who are chronically anxious and have insomnia, how come they can have cravings and be ADD for a while? Isn't that supposed to be the symptom that happens to people with low dopamine? Well, these are great questions. So here's my answer. The body can change the level of dopamine much, 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 much faster. It takes about two seconds, two minutes, than it can change the number of receptors. So if you think about this, think of dopamine like the ocean. The tide goes in, the tide goes out. It's happening by the minute. The waves are going up and down. So your body's trying to adjust the receptors to appropriately match the molecules of dopamine so that your brain is in this optimum range. So let's say somebody is right here where my cursor is. They have low dopamine and they've been in a low dopamine state for several months. Well, the body has adapted to this set point of dopamine by increasing the number of receptors. But what if this person suddenly uh, you know, is studying for finals or gets bad news about a sick family member or there's a divorce going on in their life and the stress kind of spikes. Well, they might momentarily dump excess dopamine into their brain for an hour or two. And because they have so many receptors, that dopamine activates a ton of those receptors and they get like a spike of anxiety. But after a few hours, the dopamine burn, burns off and they kind of go back to their normal set point where they spend most of their time in low catecholamine situations or, or uh, you know, feelings and um, symptoms. And so we look at the high end of the curve, we see the same process going on. Let's say an individual is just you know, pushing through life, they're in their mid-20s, they're a high achiever, they're an athlete, they're training a lot, they're going through law school, they're, they're you know, planning a wedding, they're moving across the country. I mean, all these stressors happening. They maybe have a hormone imbalance going on that with too much estrogen, so it drives their dopamine levels higher. And so now their dopamine level is like way over here. They're at the far end of this curve. What the body's done to avoid having like a 24-hour panic attack is it's removed receptors. It's like trimmed them down. It just makes those receptors go away because it doesn't want to have that much dopamine activity. And so if this person in this second scenario, um, you know, ends up skipping a meal or two and um, you know, kind of burns through their B vitamins and just isn't taking really good care of themselves, they could have a moment where their dopamine kind of, the tide goes out, right? So their dopamine level kind of lowers quickly. Um, and in that situation where the dopamine is lowering quickly, but the receptors are also low, that's when you could have a symptom of a craving or have, um, you know, an ADD kind of brain fog moment or 
maybe even have an angry kind of grumpy experience in this person's life, even though most of the time, this person on the second example is actually a high catecholamine person. So I, again, I'm trying to explain this idea and it's a, it's a bit kind of um, you know complex, but I hope this model makes sense that you're seeing the body adjust the number of receptors in response to the level of dopamine. And that's all good and well. The body does that. It's an established process. It's called receptor autoregulation. Our bodies do that for all kinds of hormones and receptors. But the problem is that dopamine receptor changes takes like 7 to 14 days. Much, much slower than the neurotransmitter. So like I said earlier, dopamine levels are like waves in the ocean. They go up and down all the time. You know, how warm the ocean is, well that takes some time to change. Consider that more like the receptors. So the dopamine in this study, uh, the dopamine receptors in this um, study published, uh, you know, over 20 years ago, it does give light to this saying that, you know, in the terms of this cocaine addiction model with animals, it takes about 14 days after tasting the drug for the receptors to sort of change. And so um, the best data that I can find shows that the receptors take some time to adapt. And what that means is that the changing in this yellow slope takes like weeks, it takes a couple weeks, it takes 10 days, 14 days. It's going to take some time for the receptors to change. Now compare that with dopamine. As a neurotransmitter, dopamine has a half-life of two minutes. That means in 10 minutes, that's five half-lives. It's practically out of your body from a, you know, a drug pharma pharmacology point of view. And so we know that dopamine, at least compared to the receptors, is moving up and down so much faster. This is what makes it hard for your body to create balance. If your dopamine levels are low, and then they spike for a few minutes, and then they go back down again and up again, it's, it's a chaos. Your body can't plan for the future if it's on a roller coaster like this. Another study that came out um, fairly recently back in 2007, I was looking for data that kind of explained exactly how long dopamine is in our synapse, how long does it stay in the brain. So what you look at here is this, this spike on labeled A is midbrain dopamine. So that's the, the midbrain, that's the part of the brain between your ears where Parkinson's disease develops, that part of the brain. And it shows that when the dopamine is squirted out, it only lasts about two tenths of a second. So in and out, really fast. When they looked at the frontal lobe, it was a little quick, little longer, right? It was actually 10 times longer, which is actually two seconds. So the, the dopamine effectively would stay active in the frontal lobe about two seconds before being sucked back up. Um, but that's not a very long time. I mean, two seconds of dopamine compared to seven to 14 days for the receptor, you start to see that this balancing act is fairly, fairly challenging for the body. So to answer the question, can you have symptoms of both high and low dopamine? Of course you can. Um, I've observed that. Many of you out there have observed that, whether you're just a patient or, or a doctor or clinician, you thought about this idea, you can recognize people can have symptoms of both. In my opinion, this model helps explain that better than anything I've found so far in that the body's changing this yellow triangle level. It's adjusting the level of the receptors to try to come in harmony with the average level of dopamine. And that's what the body's trying to do to create a set point, get the thermometer set at the right place so everybody's comfortable. But when you have an up and down roller coaster because you've got leaky gut and SIBO and fungal overgrowth or horrible sinus infections that you've been dealing with for years that are now fungal in nature, um, or you have you know, a multitude of other health issues, adrenal fatigue, hormone imbalance, heavy metal issues, you, you get to see the picture here that with, if that's what's going on in the rest of your body, your brain's not going to be able to balance itself out. That's why in our practice we work a whole lot with gut problems. It's, it's not only rewarding work, it's fun to see people get better, it's just necessary. People are having significant problems in their intestines. We're all being exposed to toxins and antibiotics that our ancestors never had to deal with and we're just now learning what those effects might be. So. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know some of you have been asking this question for a while, um, and I, I appreciate that you do ask the question because it definitely um, gets the wheels turning. But that's the best answer I can come up with, that the catecholamine set point model, um, your body's trying to come into harmony to get the ratio between your receptors and your dopamine to be balanced. 
dopamine moves up and down by the second, basically, um, and your receptors move up and down by the, by the day or week. So you can see it's a bit of a challenge. We really want to do everything we can to honor your, genet honor your genetics, what your tendencies are, and then create stable bit dopamine delivery. Whether you're a low catecholamine person, we want to raise dopamine in a stable way. And if you're a high catecholamine person, we'd like to get your dopamine levels a little bit lower and do that in a healthy, natural way to keep your brain working optimally. So thanks for listening, everybody. Um, expect more videos coming out soon. I, I do apologize for the hiatus. It's been a, 2018 was a really big year in a lot of ways. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to share with you is all the information that I have that I think would be valuable to you. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you've, made it, you've made it through the video. Hopefully there's some, some information here that you can relate to your own life, to your friends, family. Um, I'm just basically sharing with you everything we use in our practice. I don't believe that healthcare should be something that you always have to pay a ton of money to get the information you need. I'd like to get all the information we can out there for free. And that's part of what this YouTube project is all about. So if you like this video, if you like our channel and the information we have, get yourself a copy of this book. But even more than that, if you're somebody out there who's looking for help for yourself, for a loved one, for a friend or family member, you reach out to us. We have a clinic that serves people from over 20 different countries. And we have people, people traveling from Europe, traveling from all over the United States to see us in person. And we also do work over the internet uh, through a telemedicine practice. So uh, be, Red Mountain Natural Medicine is the name of our office here in Boise. And if you like what's on this video and you need some help yourself, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'll figure out a way to help you get the help you need. Thanks so much and have, a, have an excellent day.